Okay, good morning, good morning. Today we're going to do a teach back on the uh, four chapters that you were supposed to study for today, right? And let's start first with uh, okay, five chapters, right? We talk about important topics such as what? The first one I would like to deal with would be blood flow, right? Well, for obvious reasons, when you become future nurses, you end up with uh, patients that you need to monitor what? All the vital signs, blood pressure, heart rate. Uh, you'll be looking at problems involving the arteries and veins, right? So when we say blood flow, of course, we talk about blood vessels, right? Because what is found flowing through the blood vessels? Blood. Would be blood. So in general, we know for a fact that in anatomy, we learned that there are two main types of blood vessels, right? What are these? Arteries and veins. Arteries and veins, right? Okay. So for the arteries and the veins, notice that the wall has how many layers? Three layers, right? And these three layers, in the middle you have the lumen. The lumen is the passageway, right? So apparently where the passage, I just I'm gonna double check, I'm maybe determine it. Okay, there you go. In the middle portion you have the lumen, and you know that the lumen is where the blood will flow, okay? The innermost wall, what do you call the innermost wall? Tunica what? Intima. Intima. Tunica means layer. Intima, intima refers to the innermost layer. Okay? And what is found in the intima would be what? Endothelium. Endothelium. Okay? The second layer is very important. What is found in the middle layer? Tunica media. And what is found in the tunica media? What? Smooth muscle. Okay. And finally, the third layer, the outermost layer. Tunica what? Adventitia. Now, some books refer to this as the tunica externa, this one, and some would refer to this as the tunica interna, from the word interna, innermost. Okay? And what is the tunica adventitia made of, class? Yes? Elastic connective tissues, right? And, and that is important. Elastic what? Connective tissue, which means it has a capacity to what? Spread, stretch out, right? Okay? Now, what about the smooth muscle layers found here? Why are they important? If you remember, muscles can either what? Contract or relax. You know that, right? Like, we have three types of muscles, skeletal attached to bones, smooth found in the wall of the arteries and veins together with the wall of hollow organs like the stomach, small and large intestine, right? <coughs> and of course, the third one would be the cardiac muscle. Muscles can either contract, hardens, and then when it relaxes, it becomes soft, right? Same thing here, the muscles can either what? Contract. So when the muscles contract, what happens to the lumen? It becomes smaller. It's called vaso what? Constrict to become smaller. And what would be the consequence if the muscles contract your vaso constriction? What would be the effect on blood flow? Hmm? What would be the effect on blood flow? Decreased blood flow, right? So decreased blood flow. And what happens to the blood pressure? High blood pressure, okay? So you have high blood pressure and blood flow will decrease, okay? Does anybody know what's another word for the decreased blood flow, right? So that's important to remember, okay? Now, on the other hand, if the muscles relax, what would be the effect? Vaso what? Dilation. And therefore, as such, what would be the effect on blood flow? Increase blood flow, but what would be the consequent effects on blood pressure? Hypotension. Okay, the blood pressure will drop. It's the opposite here. So you might be wondering, you know, why do I need to know all these things? A person who is a student in nursing or any field of healthcare provider, like as a nurse, as a doctor, not just do you need to know the anatomy of 
an organ, a structure, but at the same time, well, what is the clinical importance, significance of these structures that you know? That means if you know what is normal anatomy, which is structure, and normal function, which is physiology, then it will be easy to know what is abnormal, right? So example, in the case of the heart, it's an example I normally give so that you understand. The aorta comes from what chamber of the heart? The left ventricle, right? As you remember, the left ventricle of the heart is the main pump that pumps oxygenated blood. Okay? And, but the heart itself has its own blood supply. Does anybody remember the name of the artery that supplies the heart? Very good. How many do we have? Two. Two. One on the right, and what's the other one? one. The left. But there are many branches. We have to go into the details. So artery is just like here. It has a lumen, it has walls, like three layers. And what does it carry? Oxygenated blood. Why? Because every single cell that you have in your heart needs what? Oxygen from the blood. Does it make sense? And again, if you remember, why do we need oxygen in the cell? What for? ATP production. ATP production in the mitochondria requires oxidative, from the word oxygen, oxidative phosphorylation to, mark, to produce ATP. Without oxygen, they will not be able to produce ATP to the maximum and the cell will die because ATP is needed for the energy requirements of the cell for all the chemical reactions, okay? So, people like me, as I get older, I do not take care of my booty, look at my tummy, my abdominal wall is getting bigger, I used to have a six pack, it's now one pack of fat. Where do you think the excess fat will deposit? The coronary arteries. Okay, here in the wall. So pretend this is the coronary artery, right? That you find there. If the moment you have fat deposit here, what do you call that condition? Atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. And what do you call that fat deposit there? It's called what? A plaque of recognition that you were about to die, okay? So people like me, who do not exercise. I used to play basketball when I was 10 years old, or maybe six, seven years old, until medical school. I was a varsity player playing this game called basketball. But after med school, I went to practice medicine. I never played basketball, okay, occasionally. Now here in the US, after 16 years here, I don't think I even played, I just keep on shooting the ball, but not really one court playing from end to end. So, with sedentary lifestyle, with so much fat gain around the abdominal girth, with me using the elevator instead of the stairs, guess what? I will be at risk of what we call coronary artery disease, which essentially is the deposition of fat here in the coronary artery, that's what's called coronary artery disease, which causes what? What happens to the lumen? The radius, the diameter becomes what? Smaller. smaller, and we'll talk about this later in the formula. If it gets smaller, what happens to the blood flow? Reduces blood. Decrease blood flow. So the presence of fat will decrease blood flow. Does anybody know the term we use? When there is decreased blood flow, in this case, because of the deposition of fat, what is the term we use? The word that is synonymous with the word decreased blood flow. Ischemia, very good. So, that's the reason why the word coronary artery disease is also known as ischemic heart disease. So these two mean the same thing. Now, because we are learned men and women, we expand. It's also known as atherosclerotic heart disease, which means they all mean the same thing. Because as we have said, what is the definition of atherosclerosis? The deposition of fat in the wall of the junica intima of the artery is causing it to harden. It's no longer elastic. This way sclerosis means hardening of the arteries, high sclerosis. So, the question now is, although this will be the topic for next week, but I'm trying to give you a, 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 a bird's eye view. A patient with ischemia of the coronary arteries leading to decreased blood flow to the myocardium will manifest with what? Angina. Angina pectoris. Angina means chest pain, pectoris means pectoral region. 
the chest. So, in angina pectoris due to ischemic heart disease, are the cells here dead? No. Not yet. Almost, okay? So the difference is that in MI or myocardial infarction, the cells are dead because there, the fat will deposit here, it gets smaller, and then the blood flow will become slower, the blood will clot, and you end up with what? Zero blood flow means MI. So can this eventually lead to a myocardial infarction in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely, guaranteed. So I will die. That's fine, because I'll meet my mom and my dad and my brother who are hopefully up there, right? And they'll welcome me, okay? But I don't know when it will happen. Hopefully not soon, because... The point is, I'm just joking, of course, my, my, my wife and family will kill me now. <laughs> Why are you thinking of death, right? But all of us will die eventually. So from here to here, okay? So the bottom line is, how do I take care of the pain of chest pain? Can I give a drug? What kind of drug do you think should I take that can I put under the tongue? Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. Why, what would nitroglycerin do? Okay, so Will it make the muscles relax or contract? Okay, so okay, relax, dilation will occur. What will vasodilation do? Increase the blood flow. So remember this. The bottom line is the problem is decreased blood flow. How do we solve the problem of decreased blood flow? By giving a drug that will vasodilate the coronary arteries will increase the blood flow. But as a nurse, a man of woman of learning knows that what will be the consequence of this? A blood in the drop in the blood pressure. That for it is essential. A smart, competent, critical thinking nurse must always get the blood pressure, heart rate, vital signs of the patient before giving the medication baseline and then monitor the blood pressure maybe every 10 or 15 minutes and properly document it in the chart. In the event that this drug was given under the tongue and apparently you gave it at six in the morning because the doctors, my order was to give the patient five milligrams of nitroglycerin every PRN. What is PRN? As needed. As needed. Okay, PRN. Does anybody know what is PRN? I know. Pro Renata. Very good. Pro Renata. You, you have a background in EMT, you said, right? So Pro Renata, that's very good. It's very rare for somebody to know that. Pro Renata, okay? Pro Renata, P-R-N means as needed, okay? So, let's say you gave a drug at 6 in the morning and you found out that after 10 minutes, the drop was slowly. From 130 over 80, it became 120. Then after 20 minutes, it went down as low as 100. Systolic. So what should you do? Are you going to call Dr. Gamo? Call the doctor. I'll tell the doctor, Dr. Gamo, I gave nitroglycerin at six in the morning as ordered by you in the chart, PRN. But as I was monitoring the blood pressure, there is a trend. The trend of patients developing hypotension. So what should I do? What do you think Dr. Gamo will tell the nurse? Lower the dose. Lower the dose, precisely. Okay, so from five milligrams, okay, 2.5 milligrams, right? The bottom line is we work together. We want smart nurses. We do not want incompetent nurses. We want nurses to know why is there a drop in the blood pressure because he or she knows her pathophysiology. We cannot afford to have nurses that are incompetent who does not know his or her pathophysiology. And you will never pass the nursing board exam if you do not know your pathophysiology. But for you to know what is pathophysiology, you have to know what is what? Normal anatomy and physiology, right? Now, the question now is, how can you make the coronary arteries vasodilate when in fact this drug was given under the tongue? Now, can we give the drug on the chest plate in the form of a skin patch? Yes. Yeah. Okay. My question now is, how is it possible for the drug placed under the tongue in the form of a sublingual preparation? Sub means below, lingua in Spanish means tongue. At the same time, here on the chest. 
Can anybody tell me how it's possible for it to reach its final destination, which happens to be the coronary arteries? Anyone who wants to volunteer? Yes. Superior In what way? You have to trace. You are almost there. Yes. So this is the heart. The superior vena cava is obviously above. Superior means above, inferior vena cava means below. It enters the right atrium, right? It carries what kind of a venous blood or arterial blood? Venous blood. Of course, it was vena from the word veins, right? And these veins that came here come from where? From you remember the anatomy of the superior vena cava? Yes? Came from, huh? from the head. Okay, all the veins of the head, all the veins of the neck, all the veins of the upper limbs. So the veins of the head, the neck, upper extremities come, bring, drain all the carbon dioxide rich blood from there. What about the veins in the, anything below the heart, the thoraco-abdominal, pelvic, and lower limbs? In fear, which makes sense, right? Thoraco-abdominal, pelvic organs, and lower extremities or lower limbs bring the blood there. And if you remember, the blood goes into the right atrium, passes to the tricuspid valve, then right ventricle, then where does the blood go here? Pulmonary what? Trunk, then pulmonary artery, then where? To the lung. In the lung, you have the capillaries, the change of gases will take place, and where does the blood go from the lung? So from the lung, the blood goes back where? Left atrium. Pulmonary. Left atrium, through the pulmonary veins, right? So do not confuse the pulmonary artery that brings blood to the lung, while the pulmonary veins bring blood from the lung back to the left atrium, thereby carrying what? Oxygenated blood here. So pulmonary veins, oxygen-rich blood goes here, left atrium, left ventricle, then eventually where does blood go? In other words, my point is, and I'm not trying to put down any nurse. Ask any nurse working in the hospital now. Do you think they can explain this? Hopefully, yes. But sometimes they do not. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm saying out of 100 nurses we will interview, and if I ask them to explain, if the doctor orders a drug under the tongue, how the hell can it be able to reach the coronary arteries? Out of those 100 nurses, what do you think will be, how many of them will be able to answer? 10. 10 is a big number already. I'm not saying they're not smart, but they could smart, but they, they don't remember the details. No but this is the details upon which they should know. Because all of them, we just follow orders. But the good thing here that the nursing profession in the United States, they're aware of that. That they need to know. They, they even question doctors sometimes, which we think we hate sometimes. You know, They think they're doctors, like we're gonna slap them. But uh, in our mind, we can just slap them then, right? Remember this, this, this TV shows, the ER, where the nurse, trying to question the decision of the doctor. I hate those parts. This is, what? Uh, and you know, but nowadays it's okay, if, as long as you know what you're doing, you can actually question your doctor. If it's going, it's going to what? Endanger the life of a patient, right? Because you are here to save lives. Sometimes doctors are also stupid, so they can make mistakes. So you can just be polite. Just don't be afraid confrontational. Anyway, going back to this, therefore. We said we put it under the tongue because what do you find under the tongue? Blood vessels. What's the smallest blood vessel? Capillaries, right? So apparently, if you put it under the tongue, it goes to the capillaries, then it goes to the venules or veins, right? And then from the veins, it goes what? It, because where is the tongue found? It's in the head. <laughs> the head, the tongue. Go to the veins, then goes what? What do you call these big veins here? Jugular veins, right? Internal jugular veins. Then it goes into the brachiocephalic veins. Eventually, it ends up in the superior vena cava. Then the drug in the blood this time is going to travel to the right side of the heart, right atrium, right ventricle, the lung, the lung, and then goes here, and it goes there to the left ventricle, then goes where? To the aorta, then eventually where? To the coronary arteries. Do you understand? It's like a GPS. If there were built in GPS, says, okay, you nitroglycerin, make a right turn at SVC. Oh, pass through at <laughs> right atrium street. Then go to the right ventricle. Okay, make a detour, go to the right pulmonary trunk street. Do you understand? 
In other words, my point is you should be able to trace. In other words, you should be able to scientifically explain why was a drug given under the tongue and it ended up in the coronary arteries. Now, what about if I give it here in the chest? Anybody here knows? Hmm? In the patch, yes. Now, what is found in the skin? Going to be the same principle. What do you find in the under, under the tongue? Capillary. 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 So, what do you think in your skin? Capillary. Yes. Epidermis, dermis, and then hypodermis. You find the blood vessels in the dermis and the hypodermis, and you have those arteries and veins. And what connects an artery with a vein? Capillary. A capillary. So, are these capillaries here in the skin? Precisely. So, the same thing. The skin has blood vessels in the form of capillaries. You put the nitroglycerin patch or isosorbide mononitrate patch here. It diffuses to the skin. It, you know, diffusion. Movement of substances from the area of high concentration to what? Low. So it goes into the blood vessels, into the capillaries, and obviously it goes to the veins here, and then goes where? It goes to the, in this case, it's the cava, then where? Same thing, the same, the same route. In other words, what is the freeway involved here? The blood vessels of the body. It goes to the heart, to the lung, and back to the heart. Do you understand? So here, the veins here will eventually end up going into the heart via the vena cava here. And as I said, the bottom line is that it's important to note that it has to reach its target organ. The problem is this. This drug will not only go to the coronary arteries, but can it also travel to the other arteries of the body? Of course, because there is no checkpoint here that says, hey, you, nitroglycerin, just go to the coronary arteries. Nobody's watching the gate. So the blood will travel together with the medication where? To all the parts of the body. There is a maintenance of a serum level concentration of nitroglycerin. And the moment it goes to the other arteries, what will be the effect? A drop in the blood pressure. Do you understand? Is that important? My, 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 my advice to all of you, you have to master anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology, biophysics, and we'll talk about formula later on. Because that's the only way to become smarter. I just want, want you to become smart, but smarter. And not only that, the smartest nurse in the world and in the universe. 10 years from now, I'll send you to Mars or Saturn or Venus. You'll be the first nurses there. You'll be in the history of humankind. The first nurse going to Mars. We're gonna put up a hospital there. Help until I'm alive, huh? And you get me on Instagram. Dr. Gamo, I'm now on the Martian planet. <laughs> you were right, you predicted that I'll be working here. I actually own the hospital there. I'm now a CEO, I'm now a rich man, okay? Because you can never become a nurse if you're just an employee. You have to be the employer, remember that. Who said that? Me, okay? I'm just joking. Who knows? You can be an employer, right? And you'll be the, the, the richest man in this world. You can, you can be the Amazon of hospitals, you know? Or nursing homes, okay? Now, going back to this. So, the idea, therefore, is whenever there is atherosclerosis, it can affect any part of the body, right? Okay? Now, there is a formula here in your book that talks about blood flow, right? It is Q is equal to B over R. Okay, what does a Q represent? Blood flow. What about the P? Okay, blood pressure gradient. So it's not just purely P, but gradient, delta P. So high pressure versus low pressure, difference, right? Difference of pressure. Which means that for the blood to flow from the left ventricle to the aorta, there has to be a generation of higher pressure here. How? With the what? With the muscles contract, systole. Blood goes there, from high pressure to low, high pressure to low, high pressure to low, right? And where does this blood go eventually? To the organs, right? It forces the diaphragm, for example, what is the name of the artery to the spleen? Splenic artery, don't you love anatomy? What's the artery to the liver? Hepatic artery, because what does hepatic mean? Okay, so left, spleen, right, liver. In other words, for this, blood to reach the target organs, there has to be a pressure gradient whereby from high pressure to low, high pressure to low, high pressure to low, high pressure to low, 
high pressure to low, eventually to the various organs. Down here you have the kidneys, right and left. Right? Now, what about R? R stands for what? Resistance. Resistance. Right? Now the idea therefore is this. Now you might think, I do, do I need to memorize this formula? It is all, not only memorizing a formula, but understanding. And not only understanding, but applying, okay? The bottom line therefore is that you're not just here to memorize a formula, but of what clinical importance will this formula be to me? Why do I need to know this formula, right? Why do I need to know that this has to have a tremendous effect on my patient, okay? So for example, can anybody tell me what is the definition of resistance? Yes, you, my dear. Uh, so it's basically um, blood flow going through the, the artery, mm -hmm. and it's the pressure that it exerts on the artery. The pressure that this exists in the artery, yes? Opposing forces. Okay, that's the word I wanted to hear. Ah. <laughs> what's the word I wanted to hear? You know what to oppose means, right? To counteract. For example, if the blood is flowing here, when the presence of fat deposit resists the flow or oppose the flow of the blood. Yes, yes or no? Yes. Yes or yes? yes? You have no choice. It has to be a yes. The presence of fat there will oppose resist the flow of blood because that is a definition of resistance, opposition of blood flow. Is it a game of words? Is it the proper name that is word? The word, the proper word, oppose, okay? Now, what is the relationship in terms of math? <laughs> no. We want our nurses to be also not good in pathophysiology, but also good in math and some extent to physics. Because you are going to be a smart, competent, critical thinking nurse. This is a formula, right? This is a numerator, this is a denominator. The equal sign is there. The, what is the relationship between Q and R? Inverse. Direct or inverse? Inverse. inverse? inverse. So I hope you understand what the hell is inverse, right? Because if not, you will be L-O-S-T. You will be lost, right? So. If this is inverse, if you increase the resistance, what happens to the blood flow? Increase. increase the blood flow. That's inverse. Example, when you put that fat deposit there, what happens to the resistance to flow? Increase. Increase. What would be the effect on blood flow? It decreases. In other words, this formula explains what happened here. This formula provides a scientific basis and mathematical basis on how come when there is fat deposit in the wall, there is increased resistance, the effect is what? Inverse, decreased blood flow will occur, and therefore you have a decreased blood flow. Does that make sense? Okay? Do you understand what I'm trying to drive at? Okay? We have to be smart in everything, not only in this, but math. Because that's the only way, scientific way of explaining things. Now, in terms of, if you, in other words, if you decrease the resistance, what happens to the blood flow? Increase blood flow, right? Now, what about pressure and blood flow? Direct. Direct relation, which means increase the pressure gradient, the blood flow will be further going up. Okay? So increase, increase. Do you understand? Because these two are direct. And we'll try to explain that in a short while, right? So in other words, the, the greater the pressure between this and this, the, the more the blood will flow. Okay? Does it make sense? Now, what about, does anybody know, remember, the Poiseuille's Law? It's in your book. P-O-I-S-E-U-L-I-L-L-E. Okay? This law is defined as R, which is resistance, a and L over pi, over pi, right? R ranges to what? To the fourth power. Is this in your book? Yes. Okay, did you memorize this formula? You should, I'll tell you why. This is resistance here, right? And we said resistance is opposing forces to the flow of blood or any form of liquid. This is, what does N stand for? 
Oh, Viscosity. Oh, what about L? L for what? Length, length of the blood vessel. What is the first letter of length? L. L. So as L stands for viscosity. Unfortunately, V is not used. I don't know why. I don't know why they use N. Maybe there's a Latin word that means viscosity in Latin. You know, but you could have just changed this to a V. I will write them a letter. I am proposing to make it easier for these students to understand. Let's change the N to V. The Camo proposal. And that's me, right? Okay. I'm just kidding. I don't care. So you know what N stands for, right? Okay. And R stands for what? Radius. And you know exactly what radius means, right? What is radius? Half of what? The diameter. In other words, my point is, you have a circle like this. Point A to point B, diameter. You put a circle in the middle of point, from A to A is what? Radius. So if you increase the radius, same thing as increasing the diameter, right? Does it make sense? Right? Is, is everybody following me? People at the back, do you understand? People at the back, can you see my handwriting here? That's how you stay in the front. There are so many chairs here, right? One, two, three, four, five, big. You can come to the front, okay? So, that's the reason why I want you to come to the front. Say, oh, Dr. Gamo, you didn't explain it to me. I said, how can I explain it to you when you're at the back? So you stay in front. These seats are available, okay? Now, the idea, therefore, is what is the relationship between viscosity and resistance? Direct, direct or inverse? Direct. Again, direct. They're numerators, which means that if you increase the viscosity, what happens to the resistance? And then this will affect too. Increase resistance, increase blood flow. The bottom line is, now you will, I, I, I ask you this, okay. It's not only knowing the formula, it's not only knowing the relations between all these factors, but you have to be able to cite examples. Example, what would increase the viscosity of the blood? See, you have to go beyond. Ask yourself, what are the possible reasons that the viscosity of the blood will increase in a natural phenomenon or abnormal situation? Does anybody know? Huh? Yes? Huh? Red blood cells. What about the red blood cell? And what do you call the condition right here? Very good. It's called poly means more red blood cell, right? I was going to say that. What is the opposite of polycythemia? When you have a decreased red blood cell count? Anemia. Okay? So you're absolutely right. You gave me the number word, you gave me the right proper term. Polycythemia. Increase red blood cell count. In other words, when there's a lot of red blood cell here in the blood, it becomes more concentrated. Viscosity becomes increased. In other words, increase viscosity, increase resistance. Increase resistance, decrease blood flow. Now, what would cause, of course, length? There's nothing you can do about it. The longer the blood vessel, remember when the blood flows here, will there be friction forces on the side of the wall? It will cause drag, it will cause the, the movement and the velocity of the blood to be slower because of the longer the blood vessel, the longer it travels to the bude, it will have an effect, the length of the blood vessel. But there's nothing we can do. Our blood vessel length is fixed, depending on how tall you are, right? Okay, now, radius, can we, of all the factors here, which can we control? Radius, because we can either make it vasodilate or vasoconstrict, right? The radius is important, and we can even give medications, as I said, that can either vasodilate or vasoconstrict. We can manipulate with R, which is radius, right? So, what is the relationship between resistance and radius? Inverse. Again, inverse. Which simply means that if you increase the radius, you decrease the resistance, and when you decrease the resistance, what happens to the blood flow? It goes up. What I'm trying to say, therefore, when we gave the drug under the tongue, right? Nitroglycerin, or on the medication skin patch here. That drug called nitroglycerin made muscles con relax, right? And therefore cause what? Vasodilation. Relax, vasodilation, what happens in the ranges? Increase blood Increase ranges, here. If you increase the ranges, you decrease the resistance. And if you decrease the resistance, what happens to the blood flow? 
it goes up. And there is no more chest pain, Dr. Gamma. Patient is happy. And then the Yelp, they will say, Dr. Gamma is good. Go to him. He tries expensive, but it's good, you know. Now I'm just joking, you know. The Yelp of MDs, right? They have all this. The bottom line, therefore, is everything we do, if you can explain in a scientific way, both anatomy and pathophysiology and mathematically, you're in good hands. We want our students to have deeper learning. We do not want our students as superficial learning means more memorizing the formula and that don't even know how to use them or don't even understand or apply them. Your goal, if this were mission impossible, your mission is to understand and be able to apply what you have learned in this classroom. The knowledge you acquire in this class should not be limited to this room. The knowledge should be remained in your brains forever until you die. So 200 years from now, I will be 258 years old. And what is the Purcell's law? Okay, it will remain the same until another mathematician will contradict this. I'm gonna change it to the Gamos law. I'm just joking, it will never happen, right? So resistance equals eight NL over by R to the four. So I, I admire these people who are good in math because they're so smart, okay? okay? So the idea therefore is that all these things, if you look closely here, we can actually try our best to explain everything that happens in the body in terms of the phenomenon. Yes, you have a question? Yeah, so uh, for Pusuei's law, which one is it? Which formula is Pusuei's? The what? Which one is Holmes? It's hard to get differentiate like which one is Holmes and which one is we have to know about that. Ohm's law is to do. Uh, the important thing, you're talking about blood flow, only this formula, okay? okay? Now, it's even hard to memorize about if I give other formulas, Ohm's and all those other, no, you don't need that. This is the only one that I believe is important, these two, okay? Now, in terms of atherosclerosis, therefore, is that a life threatening condition? It is, especially if it leads to what? From this MI. to an MI, definitely. Another word that I would like to advise to all of you young people, in the next one or two years, you'll be taking the nursing board exam. Any condition that is life-threatening, concentrate. What are the chances of those topics or disease states being come out in the nurse, or come out in the nursing board exam? 100%. You understand what I'm saying? Ignore those things that are not important. What I'm trying to say, therefore, is there's so many things, right? But you have to de determine which one is important for me as a nurse, which one is relevant to me. All the other laws, all these other formula, they could be relevant, but as of the moment, these are the only things I'd like you to know, okay? Because just to know this thing, you might not even be able to memorize this. But the bottom line is that anything that is going to affect the patient that will kill the patient, remember them, right? Now. So in terms of the blood vessels, there are many conditions that we mentioned. I already mentioned about atherosclerosis, heart disease, okay? Now, question is, do you know the difference between a thrombus and an embolus? What is a thrombus and what is an embolus? Okay, let's ask people from the back this time. I want them to participate. Because one of the goals in, remember the CLO, Course Learning Outcomes and PLO's program, is to make these people be able to what? participate in an intellectual discussion so that they can practice their oral communication skills. The only people talking right now are the people in front. Let's call on, okay, yes? Uh, is stationary. Uh, stationary what? Stationary clot. Blood clot, and what about embolus? Uh, uh, I guess blood it's a traveling clot, you know, travel, it moves. You're absolutely right. Cardio embolic, for example, If you have a clot in the right atrium, will it go to the brain? Yes or no? What? Yes or no? No. Okay, why not? Because the right is for the left. Huh? Where does the blood clot if it's in the right atrium? So let's, 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 let's hold my hands. I will guide you, okay? If the clot was here, 
It goes where next? Go. What chamber? Right ventricle. Right then where? Pulmonary artery. Trunk and artery, and then goes where? Okay. The lung. Okay. Why do you think it will stop in the lung? Small what do you find? What do you call the small blood vessels in the lung? Capillaries. And what do you call them? Pulmonary capillaries, right? Do you realize that if this were an artery, what is what do you call a small artery, an arterial? Okay, the capillary is so small that only one what red blood cell could go through in terms of microns. Then what's the next blood vessel? The veins, the small venules, and the arterioles. And what is surrounding the capillary? Cells. It could be a brain cell, it could be a muscle cell, bone cell. In other words, where do you find the capillaries? Everywhere and anywhere. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? The red blood cell here has a passenger in the arterial. It's called oxygen. What is the name of the passenger in the Red blood cell here. Hi, my name is Oxygen. I am the passenger. Every single cell in the body needs me for oxidative phosphorylation in the most mitochondria. Can you imagine a red blood cell talking to you? I am important to you. Okay? So I will carry this for free. All I need is glucose. Okay, I go here. And then because, <clears throat> again, <laughs> my voice, it has changed. I think I'm getting puberty. <laughs> the red blood cell carries oxygen. And remember, what is the definition of diffusion? From high? From high? So all the cells get their necessary oxygen that they need. And the cells will be thankful. The cells will tell the red blood cell, thank you, red blood cell. You made my day. So good for you to give me your oxygen. <laughs> now, and the cell will say, okay, now, the red blood cell, I can just imagine the red blood cell opening the door of the bus. It's called the red blood rapid transit system. Open the bus, kicks the <laughs> oxygen. And then <laughs> the bus becomes empty. Who do you think will become the passenger of the bus? Okay. So the bus will now have a new passenger in the form of carbon dioxide. And here comes the carbon dioxide, the door is open. Hi, Mr. Red Blood Cell, I'm carbon dioxide. Two oxygen atoms and one carbon atom. I am considered to be a waste product. Can you bring me please to the lung? Can you imagine? The Red Blood Cell is the red bus. The Red Blood Cell is so kind. Brings the carbon dioxide where? To the lung, how? Of course, again to the veins, right? All the veins carries carbon dioxide rich blood, goes here, goes there, goes there, and then what happens in the lung? Exchange of gases will take place between what? The air sac and the pulmonary capillaries, and what happens? The carbon dioxide now is going to be exhaled, right? In other words, from high to low, from high to low, the red blood cell now carries carbon dioxide rich blood, right? Okay? So the, the idea, therefore, is when this is happening, okay, you have what? That blood flow. Now, the question is, when you have a blood clot, okay, in the right side here, it gets stuck here in the capillaries of the lung. Why? It's a big clot. It has to get stuck there. It's called pulmonary what? Um, listen. Now, how can therefore the clot reach the brain? Right side of the heart or left side of the heart? Left. Left side of the heart. Now, can anybody trace to me Let's ask the lady to, in the corner. Yes, my dear. We talked about the possibility of a clot going to the brain. What's your name? Adriana. Adriana. How is it possible for the blood clot in the left atrium or left ventricle to be able to reach the destination called brain langia? Do you know Adriana? Yes. So it goes, so from the left atrium, it goes to the left ventricle, or from the left, it goes, what would be the next freeway it will go through from the left ventricle? So it's now here in the left ventricle, where do you think it will go next? Of course, because there's no other way. 
called the what? Aortic freeway, right? It's called ascending. What does ascending mean? Going up. Then arch, then what? Descending. So how is it possible to reach the brain? There has to be a pathway, right? Do you remember the anatomy of the aortic arch? What is there for the artery or blood vessel that brings blood through the brain? Adriana? The three little branches, the three little pigs, right? <laughs> okay, let's find out. This one branch here, there's one branch here, another branch here. Okay, Adriana. Which are the three branches that you are referring to? Okay, let's find out. What is the first branch here on the left side? Anyone? Subclavian, not subclavicular. It's on the left, it's the left subclavian, which comes directly from the aortic arch. What about the middle one? Left common what? Carotid. Common carotid. And the right? Brachiocephalic. Okay? In other words, the brachiocephalic will divide into what? Right subclavian and? Right common carotid and right subclavian. Okay? Sub means that artery will eventually end up below what is club, clavicle. The subclavian becomes what? In the axilla, axillary. Don't you love anatomy? The artery will change its name based on the location, but it's the same artery. Here it's called subclavian, it's below the clavicle. Then the same artery goes to the axilla, it will change name to become what? Axillary artery. Then upon reaching the arm, what's another word for arm? Brachial. So axillary becomes brachial, then it becomes radial and ulnar, because ulnar to the ulnar side. On the other hand, the common carotid will go where? To the neck. The common carotid will divide into internal and? Which one do you think will go to the brain? Internal or external? Of course, internal. Don't you love it? <laughs> Give me an intellectual seizure. <laughs> I love anatomy, everything makes sense now. Okay. The common carotid brings blood to <laughs> external means to the face, internal means to the brain. And then eventually that internal becomes what? Middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and posterior circulation. In other words, the bottom line is that if you know your anatomy, and you know what is normal? There is nothing that you cannot answer in the nursing board exam. You will get the perfect score! Some of the boogers is coming down. <laughs> so be careful the people in front, okay? There could be a boogeratic explosion. Like a water okay, water world, water works. Okay, now. So, Adriana, in your own words, after hearing what I've just told you, if this were a GPS, what does GPS stand for? GPS, you always hear the word GPS. But did you ever ask yourself, yes, my dear, what's your name? Edita. Edita. What does GPS stand for? Okay. Anya, the one who volunteered for the crutches. <laughs> You know GPS? No. Okay, Sonia, Sonia, right? Sophia. So, Sophia? <laughs> Sophia? <laughs> Sophia? Oh, Sophia, I'm sorry, I like Sonia. I like those names, Sonia, sexy, and Sonia. <laughs> Sophia, yes. My, my crush when I was a small kid was Sophia Loren. Do you know her? Yes. She's so pretty and so, never mind, <laughs> I'm in trouble. But now I think she's already 70, she's old already, with all the, she's so, she's an Italian woman, Sophia Loren. Google her, look at her. Yes? Is it geographical? Okay, let me, I, I'm just right. pulling your leg. It means, yes? Global positioning system. What? Global positioning system. Okay, so global positioning system. You know that, right? Global <laughs> positioning system. Why? Because with global positioning means the satellite will guide you where to go, right? Guide you. In fact, it's called Gamo positioning system. I'm just joking. My last name is Gamo. I'm just joking, okay? Global positioning system. Okay, so Adriana, let us use the global positioning system GPS. Okay, you turn on the car, you turn on the GPS, and the GPS will help guide you to go to the brain. 
what is so you put there your initial location will be what left atrium okay so so the GPS okay Adriana imagine the, the, the GPS knows your name Adriana go south towards what from left atrium to where go to the left ventricle then where do we go next from the left and there where do we go Northwest. Okay, they go to the Pacific Coast Highway, <laughs> Iota, ascending, then what? What is this, Adriana? Common carotid, right? And then eventually where? To the brain. My bottom line is that you should be able to trace the flow of the clap. How is it able to go to the brain? Okay. Here, it can never go to the brain. Why? It gets filtered or stranded in the lungs. On the other hand, if the clap form here, it goes where? Anywhere. Why? Because it can travel to the brain, it can double here. OMG, the cloud says, I love this. I become a tourist. I can travel, go, I can I go to the liver, yes. Can I travel to the slit spleen, yes. I want to go to Europe, Italia, and uh, Spain. You understand? Now, can it travel to the right side of the brain, yes. It's called cardioembolic stroke. Cardio means heart, embolic means it's a traveling cloud that came from the heart. Which side of the heart, left atrium or left ventricle? Now the bottom. Now, how does a person become smarter than what is smart? By looking at all the possible questions that could be asked. We said that there is a cloud that can form here. Now the question is, how is possible to form a cloud there? Why would a cloud form there? Now, I know this is the lesson for next week, but I'm just trying to you to think deeply. I'm trying to preempt for next week's lecture, but it's related to this because blood flow. Yes? Okay, I'll answer my own question. Remember when the heart pumps blood regularly with regular rhythm, regular sinus rhythm, the heart pumping action is controlled by the pacemakers of the heart. SA node, AV node, bundle of this, right bundle brands, left bundle brands, and Purkinje fibers. These nodes provide electrical stimulation that the muscles will contract, right? The muscles will not contract unless there is what? Electrical stimulation coming from the pacemakers of the heart. Now, what happens in coronary artery disease? You have fat deposit there. Will the blood flow be normal? No. No, it will be abnormal. Can that affect the pacemakers of the heart? Yes. Definitely, right? So the pacemakers of the heart will be affected you may develop what we call arrhythmia. What is a ah? without rhythm, right? So, normally, and we'll talk about this next week, but I'm just gonna give you a preview. Equidistant, okay? There are many ways here, but I'll talk about this next week. P, Q, R, S, T, okay? So the distance from it is equal, equal, equal. Regular sinus rhythm, from the word sinoatrial node, sinus rhythm. Primary pacemaker is the SA node, the sinoatrial node. When you have fat deposit there and it affects the blood flow to the myocardium, in the myocardium you find the pacemakers from the SA node in the right atrial wall, AV node, bundle of this, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So the moment the pacemakers are affected, you have an arrhythmia. Okay? So instead of like that, you have a. If it affects the atrium, it's called atrial fibrillation. If it affects the ventricle, it's called ventricular fibrillation. From VTAC to VFib. And then if you're lucky, flat line. What does the flat line mean? There's no more electrical activity of the heart. Without electrical activity, there is no what? Muscle contraction. In other words, you went into cardiac arrest. So therefore, the heart will be I'm just kidding. You know, when you arrest somebody, you put what? What do you want to see? Handcuffs. Cardiac arrest. Arrested the heart. <laughs> the patient is dead. There's a reason why we say, cold blue, cold blue. <laughs> Everybody is in a rush, right? Don't, can you imagine if once somebody is dying in cold blue, and here you are. Yes? You need me, doctor? Oh my God. <laughs> Bring the crash cart. 
Start, I'm clear, I'm clear, everybody clear! <laughs> Start and clear, everybody clear! No response. Okay, time of death, 8.07. November 16, 2018, signed by Dr. Gamo with the nurse present, okay? Now, on the other hand, if you're a lucky person, then, can you imagine saving somebody's life with now we have here what we call AED. Have you seen the AED here? What does AED stand for? Automated external defibrillator. It's a smaller version. It's very user friendly. All you need is open it or turn it on, bang! Or you just open it automatically turns on. Attach the bag, blah 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 blah. Just just listen carefully, okay? Why? Because you have to defibrillate. Now going back to this therefore. In the formation of atrial fibrillation due to ischemic heart disease, there is a time what we call a what? A lag or a, basically what they call skip beats. So how is it possible for the blood to clot when it's not moving continuously? When the blood flow is continuous, like continuous movement, there is no way for the blood to clot. When I was a young boy growing up in the Philippines, I was very observant. We have because people, we call them house help, not we don't call them servants. So I'm very, I watch them, you know, and we don't have those rough things where you have the, 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 the chicken is prepared, right? So we have a live chicken and our help, house help would kill the chicken in front of me. I was a small boy. Oh my God, killing the chicken with a knife. And, and then, of course, I was such, a, I think I was really a, meant to be a scientist, so I put the, the blood in the, <laughs> they put the blood in what? An empty glass, two A and B. In one, you put the blood, in the other one, you put what? The blood, and you what? You continuously move the blood. What happens to the blood that is not being moved? It coagulates. What's another word for coagulate? Blood clot, okay? Same thing. When this is not moving because it has a skip beat, instead of ching 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 Chig chig or when chig 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 yeah. <laughs> so the moment it so during the time it's not pumping chig 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 chig. A clot is formed. After two or three or four seconds, bang bang bang. Patient get paralyzed. Stroke, cardioembolic strokes. Okay. So atrial fibrillation is the most common cause of, one of the more common cause of cardioembolic strokes, right? So in other words, we treat the problem in the heart to treat the problem in the brain. Does that make sense to you, okay? So the idea therefore is that it's all important. Now there is another condition that is mentioned in our outline called phlebitis, thrombophlebitis. Okay, let's ask the lady in blue, my dear. This person, right? Yes. What is thrombophlebitis, my dear? Thrombo Phlebitis. What do you understand of the word from the phlebitis? It's a blood clot in the vein that causes pain. Okay, it's a blood clot in the vein. Which vein? Which is the most common source of pain? The legs. The leg veins, right? The leg vein is what? Is it inflamed or not? Phlebitis. Yes. Yes, it is from the word phlebo means vein. Remember? When I say it called the phlebotomist, what does the phlebotomist do? Phlebo omi means what? Create an opening by the use of a syringe, a needle so the blood can be drained, right? When you want to get blood specimens. The phlebotomist does that in the hospital, right? Phlebotomist. So when I say phlebitis, what is inflamed? The vein, because itis means inflamed, like appendicitis, the appendix is tonsillitis. So phlebitis, phlebo means vein, the vein is inflamed. And thrombo means a stationary clot, that means the clot is attached to what? To a vein on the wall, okay? Now the question is this, what will lead to the development of thrombophlebitis? Let's ask the gentle, uh, the lady on the wall near you. What's your name in here? So, yes, you're the Sonia. Okay. Yes. What could a what could be a predisposing factor? You're working in the hospital or in nursing home. What are what are the main reasons why people develop thrombophlebitis? The primary reason. Okay, the lady in front of you. Let's, let's concentrate on the people at the back. Yes. Um, the mobilization, if the patient or the resident in the nursing home doesn't move, have 
Okay, immobilization, lack of exercise. Just lie down in bed. Have you ever seen these nursing home patients? They're so depressed because you are not visiting them. You think, you tell them, I love you, but you don't even visit them. You only go there once a month or once a year. If you love somebody that's your mom, your dad, you should visit them every day. Both my parents, I would really visit them every day. How many of you have parents, I don't want to go into being personal, but visit them because what happens if they're depressed? They don't move, they just lie down in bed, I want to die, my daughter is not visiting me. Have you ever realized that? I know we all love our parents, right? I hope, right? I hope we all love our parents. So you're gonna visit them, or grandparents. So if they don't move, they lie down in bed for one week, oh my God, they develop all these bed sores and then they'll develop thrombophlebitis. Now, Okay, let's ask the gentleman to your right. What's your name? Yeah. Greg. Greg. Okay, what do you think is the most common complaint of a patient with thrombophlebitis? Let's say it's in the right leg. What would they tell the nurse? The nurse, 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 I have thrombophlebitis. Would they tell you that? No, they don't, right? You don't go into West Coast University School of Nursing. So they know what the word thrombophlebitis means, right? So what do you think will they tell you? Uh, uh, what's the name again? Greg, hi, Nurse Greg. Nurse Greg, Nurse Greg, can you please help me? What do you think? Will, what will be the chief complaint? Uh, Remember, in, in your one of the discussion board, pathophysiology, history, present complaint, and signs and symptoms, yes? Probably pain Okay. These are the cardinal signs of inflammation. Fla inflamed vein. Inf anything that's inflamed. Dolor. What is dolor? Yeah. And is that the pain? symptom or sign? Symptom. Remember, symptom, okay? So they will say, I have right leg, right leg pain. Now, Greg, patient comes to you and say, Nurse Greg, Nurse Greg, I have pain in my right leg. What do you think should you do? You get the history or you get a, do a physical exam right away? History. You know what history of present illness? History and physical. Okay, somebody will say, Nurse Greg, Nurse Greg, I have pain in my right leg. What do you think should you do first, Greg? Huh? Okay. Which one do you do? Is history or physical? physical. Let's go physical or let's go history? Physical. Who says physical? Who says history? Well, we are trained as doctors nurse to start with history first. I'll tell you why. So you ask first, before you even do a physical exam, you say history. What do you mean by, that's what's called history or present illness, right? What do you, what's, what do you mean by that? You ask them first. Okay, what did I say? I have what? Right leg pain. So before you do even even attempt to examine the leg, what what are the things that you'd probably ask? Have you had this pain before? Have you had this pain? What else? How long has it been going on? How long? When did it start? What's the quality of your pain? When did it happen? Was it involved in a traumatic experience? Did you kick the dog and you you know you know what I mean? Did you fall, my dear? My point therefore is you wanna rule out if there's history of trauma. If the patient was hit, the bump, the leg on a chair, it could be the reason why there's pain, okay? So you ask these questions. When did it start? Oh, it started only yesterday, one day prior to coming to ask you. So is that important as a nurse, as doctors? We do the same thing, okay? So if a patient comes to the ER and says, I have chest pain, we want to know, when did it start, sir? Two hours ago. Then once we have an idea, they do the physical exam, we do it, we treat the patient because that could be a life-threatening condition, right? We don't spend 24 hours just to get the history. <laughs> get the basic con chief complaint, right leg pain, when did it start, how did it start, was there trauma involved, when, why, okay? And then that's the time you do the physical exam, okay? Okay, now, the gentleman to your back, what's your name? Wesley. West, Wesley, 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 nurse Wesley. After getting the history, the patient said, oh no, there was no trauma here involved, it just happened since yesterday. I was just lying down in bed for the past one week and no trauma. I just noticed that my right leg was painful. So in order to do a physical exam, Wesley, what would you do, Wesley? The patient's right leg is painful. You know what to do when you do, when you do a physical examination. It's part of what we call nursing assessment. Yes, Wesley? Uh, you would have to. Uh, you have to what? Well, you have to like Look, okay, it's called ocular inspection. Ocular means eye inspection means what? For you to be able to see the leg, what, you, what should you do with the leg? <laughs> what am I doing, Leslie? Uh, Wesley? 
You like my leg? Yes. It doesn't work, Wesley! What are you going to do? Uh, well. What do you do with the pants? If you're wearing pants or pajama, or I don't know what you, what, what you wear. In other words, you have to expose the right leg, right? Yes. How can you see the leg if it's... How can you examine the leg if there's tight jeans there, you know? Like a grandma with tight jeans. I want to be sexy, Dr. Gamma, I want to tight jeans, you know? You have to expose the leg. Okay, what are you going to look for in the leg, Wesley? Another sign is what? What is it that causes you to think of inflammation? Aside from dolor, there should be what? Redness, that is rubor in Spanish. Rubor means red. R-U-B-O-R. -R. Then what do you do next? Palpate with your fingers, right? What is calor? Calor means what? Warm. Right? Caliente, warm. And what is tumor? Increase in size. So dolor, pain. Uh, rubor, redness, inspection by the eye, two more, increase in size, and of course what? Uh, the uh, warm, calor, caliente. Now, of course, better yet, am I going to get a, what do you call that, measuring tape? I can compare the right leg with the left leg, how? For example, I say 10 cm from the fibular head here, this is the left leg normal. The normal circumference, you know what the word circumference means? Yeah. It's, let's say, 20 cm. On the right leg, it is what? Where the pain is and where the redness is, it's like 30 cm. That means there is a discrepancy of what? Around 10 cm discrepancy, which means it's but bigger in size. Is that a more scientific, better way of documenting? If you do that, I salute you. You really come from West because you're very smart. We would like to make clones of you because you are now in terms of what? Because how would I know it's improvement? Because of what? After one week, the size of the circumference will become smaller. There's no more redness. There's no more pain. Is it improving? Yes, it is. Okay? Now, okay, so now the question is, thrombophlebitis, inflammation in the leg, there's a clot there. It could have been prevented if, what is primary prevention? Prevention by preventing it out. Exercising it, letting them stand, walk, use a walker. If they have to use a walker, exercise, dance. It will prevent. But the problem now is, what if, if you already have been diagnosed to have thrombophilip, are you going to move that leg? No. no. Okay. Why not? Because you could What would happen if you move that leg? Dislodge the promise. Dislodge the clot. In other words, the clot will travel from the leg vein where? So venous vein, and then where? Iliac vein, and then what? Vena cava, and then where? To the heart, and then what? Where does it stop? Pulmonary. Pulmonary lungs, pulmonary embolism. Is that life-threatening? Yes. Can that kill the patient? In other words, if a patient has been diagnosed with thrombophlebitis and you started to exercise the leg and then suddenly complains of chest pain, could that be chest pain due to pulmonary embolism? So not only do you have chest pain, in where is the lung found in the chest? Will there be chest pain in pulmonary embolism? Yes. Will there be, S what is SOB? Sure. Son of a bitch, oh, shortness of? Breath, a joke only, shortness of breath, right? So chest pain with shortness of breath, bam, pulmonary embolism, you just kill the patient because why? You exercise the leg. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that do not, I repeat, do not exercise a leg where you are suspected or diagnosed with thrombophlebitis because it will cause the clot to become slug and become a traveling clot. Pulmonary embolism will occur. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm trying to say here, okay? Now, what's the difference between DVT and thrombophlebitis? What does DVT mean? Deep vein thrombosis. And what does deep vein thrombosis involve? Deep veins or superficial veins? Don't you love it not to be? Deep vein thrombosis, therefore, means the clot is in the deeper veins of the leg. Now, the most common scenario is this. Like me, I went home to the Philippines 15, for 15 hours last year. I, went, I attended my High school, 40th, can you imagine I'm that old? 40th high school, I'm 58. 40th high school reunion, 40th year after we graduated in 1977. So the plane that goes to the Philippines takes 15 hours, flying over the Pacific Ocean. So what happens if I sit there on my chair in the plane for 15 hours straight? Will that cause a clot to form in my leg veins, the deep veins? Yes. That's the reason why they recommend that one. Go around the plane, walk around, meet pretty women. 
no, I'm just, I can't do it because my wife was with me, so I can never do it. So I just pretend that I'm going to the restroom, even there was no line. Honey, I'm going to the restroom. Okay, go to the restroom and go back to the, my honey, and go to the restroom. And I was actually exercising in the what? The plane. Okay, I was walking in the plane. Okay, and it's a stopover. Depending on what plane you take, either Hong Kong or in in Japan, or in in uh, uh, South Korea. So basically, you have to move your leg. You have to go around, okay? Or else you you end up with a DVT. So when you have a DVT, you go to the carousel, you landed in your destination, and then suddenly you have chest pain again with difficulty with the breathing. When you're taking your baggage or luggage, you could die. Okay, be careful. So that is what it is. Now, okay, now. In terms of, let's go move on to the chapter on oxygen transport, it's about what? Red blood cells, right? We talked about red blood cells in terms of they're produced by, where do you produce the red blood cells? Bone red bone marrow. So red blood cells are, what about white blood cells? Still the same. What about platelets? Still the same, right? And this red blood cell, as they get older, they lose their nucleus and organelles. In other words, the cytoplasm does not have any organelles. It relies solely on what? glucose as a source of energy, right? The main function is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? And they die in how many days? 120 days, right? Apparently they die in 120 days. And where do they die? Where is the forest lawn cemetery of these red blood cells? In the spleen land, yeah, okay, spleen. It's called spleen cemetery, okay? So I, if I am a red blood cell, I am a biconcave disc, 119 days. One more day and I will die. So I started to go to the spleen. So you remember, the spleen is there. <laughs> Where's my GPS? I want to go to the spleen, I want to die. <laughs> oh my God, it's almost there. <gasps> if I'm reaching the spleen, the spleen will what? <gasps> the final resting place. <laughs> now what happens in the spleen? What does it, what? Yes, you, what happens in the spleen? What's your name? Hey. Huh? What's your last name? My last name? Yeah. My okay, rem I remember the, your last name because I, I just want, because I might forget this. Some, one or two people, when they did the discussion board, you gave me an attachment, please do not do that. Right? There was another woman who, or person, okay? I, I might forget to remind you. When you do the discussion board, put, do not put an attachment. Remember what I told you? You have to write directly on Blackboard, right? Just, I might forget to remind you. There was another person, please do that. Or else, it's hard to give a grade on the rubric, okay? Like, do not in attachment, like, okay, going back, okay. So when a patient has that, uh, so what happens now? So, we're, 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 we're talking about the spleen. So what, what happens in the spleen? With the red blood cell? Do you know what happens there? Anybody who knows? Huh? So what happens in the spleen? What, what will happen to the red blood cell? What will happen to the dead carcass of the red blood cell? Filter with us. It's recycled. Okay, what, what is the red blood cell made of? Two alpha and two beta chains of, remember hemoglobin? Globin chains, alpha and beta chains of globin. Globin means protein. In the middle portion of those four chains is what? The hem component. Hemo is what? You have the, uh, the porphyrin ring and inside the ring is the iron. And then iron is where the oxygen will be found. The iron therefore can be recycled. It's a big recycling plant there in the spleen. I thank the spleen. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the spleen. Thank you, spleen, for doing the dirty job of recycling. So can you imagine when the red blood cell dies, you get the iron and bring it back where? To the blood circulation, to the red bone marrow. Isn't it amazing? We get to use it again for the future generation of red blood cells. Does it make sense, okay? Imagine that, wow, amazing. Recycling and it's good for you, okay? Now, when you have problems with the red blood cell count, it's called anemia, a decrease in the red blood cell count. Now, what's the most common type of anemia? Iron deficiency. Why, because in order to produce red blood cells, you need iron, does that make sense? Yeah. And you are pregnant, how many have been pregnant before? Nobody has been pregnant, okay? When you were pregnant, did the doctor give you any medication for iron supplements? Yeah. It's called ferrous sulfate, right? Because why? You are competing with your baby. The baby inside is said, Mommy, I'm sorry, I have to get some of your iron. 
for my red blood cell production too. So this drug called ferrosulfate was given to you. Now, Anya, you were given ferrosulfate. Do you remember? Did the doctor tell you anything before the drug was given to you? I don't remember. Okay, the two other ladies are at the back. Yes, uh, Adriana. The what? I like you, Adriana. You remember what the doctor told you? Your stool will turn what? Now, Adriana, what is the normal color of our stool? You and I are the same human species, homo sapiens. What is the normal color of our stool? Golden brown. Golden yellow brown. Does it smell? Of course it smells, right? Now, you said in patients with ferrous sulfate, it turns what? Black, we said, right? Did you say black? Men in black? Okay, black in stool? Okay. Is that normal, Adriana? Because of the effect of the drug. If it's not because of the drug, it could be bleeding ulcers, right, in the stomach? You know what I mean? It's called melina, you know? You know what's melina? Okay. The stool becomes black tar. What is tar? Like tar pits in Brea. <laughs> Tar is black, man. the one with uh, asphalt on the road. So when your stool becomes black instead of golden yellow brown, is that Houston, we have a problem here. It could be bleeding ulcer. The blood is slowly sheets, going down there. But because you were given fair soap, is that a side effect of the drug? But still, we have to determine, is it really the effect of the drug? So women who are, what about the young lady too? What's your name? You also got pregnant, right? Oh, and are you given? Are you being given this drug? I haven't been, so I'm thinking about that. Uh, well, I don't know. You ask your OB. I'm not gonna be your OB, but the ob obstetrician will always warn you ahead of time. Adriana, we're gonna give this drug, but watch out because your stool might turn from golden yellow brown to black. It's okay, unless you have a pre-existing ulcer. You know what pre-existing means, right? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Now, if the bleeding ulcer is really massive, can the blood become fresh? Yes, so instead of black stool, you have a cherry red stool. And if it's cherry red, it means fresh blood. Or when you have what, lower GI bleeding, which means what, below the duodenum, everything that is lower GI, when you have like a hemorrhoids, can that cause fresh blood in the stool. So instead of calling it melina, black stool is called hematochesia. What is hematochesia? Fresh blood in the stool, fresh red, cherry red blood in the stool, okay? Now, okay, so, Iron deficiency. Now, what's other forms? Like, if you lack uh, intrinsic factor, it can lead to what? Pernicious, Pernicious anemia, which is a form of mega megaloblastic. Now, B12 is absorbed via the effect of intrinsic factor, right? B12 is vitamin B12, B with 12, also known as cyanocobalamin, okay? Vitamin B12 will be absorbed in the small intestine via the action of intrinsic factor. Now, where do you produce the intrinsic factor? Stomach wall, which cell? Parietal cell or parietal cell? Parietal right. cell, together with the hydrochloric acid. In other words, if the parietal cell of the stomach wall does not produce enough intrinsic factor, you will not be able to absorb what? The B12, and is B12 necessary for the production of your red blood cell? Yeah. So what kind of anemia? Pernicious anemia, does that make sense? Now, there's another form of anemia called megaloblastic anemia. What? I'm sorry, uh, aplastic what? anemia. What? I'm sorry, aplastic anemia. What? Okay, what happens in aplastic anemia? What's your name? Leia. Leia, Princess Leia, right? Okay. Mrs. Princess Leia, what happens in aplastic anemia? You said pan-cytopenia. For the benefit of your classmates, please tell us exactly what is the meaning of the word pan, P-A-N, cytopenia. You forgot. It's okay. Yes, your race. She's trying to help you. Do you know her? Do you know her? Leah? Yes. Okay, Leah, what's her name? Rachel. Rachel. Do you know her cell phone numbers? No. You should. You're impressed, right? Friends should know their phone numbers. In case you're absent today, you ask her. Leah, what did Dr. Gamot discuss? Okay. Yes. Oh, man. Rachel. What is Rachel? <laughs> oh, what is what is Pansa Pina? It includes all the Yes. Low, low, low what? Low, uh, red blood cells. Low red blood cells. So there is anemia in pan What else? There's low uh, white blood cells. It's called leukopenia from the word leukocyte. 
low red blood cell anemia, low white blood cell count, leukopenia. And the third one is what? Low platelet, low platelet count. The platelet is not a cell, it's a fragment of a cell called megacaryocyte. It got fragmented, therefore a platelet is not even a cell. We used to call the platelet thrombocyte, but cyte means cell, it's not. But still, we still use the word thrombocytopenia. T-H-R-O-M-B-O-C-Y-T-O-P-E-N-I-A. What is thrombocytopenia? Low platelet count. If your platelet count is low, you will, will what? Bleed. Because the blood will not be able to clot. So, low red blood cell, low white blood cell, low platelet is? But is that seen in aplastic anemia? Yes. Why? You see? You always ask yourself why, how, where, when, where? Where, where do you think is the problem here, my dear? Where is the problem? How is it possible to develop pancytopenia? And why would that happen? That is how you prepare for a board exam or a quiz here, right? Yes? You know the answer, but you have to be able to explain. Anybody? Yes? Uh, there can be injury to, injury to the bone here. Which one, red or yellow? Uh, red. Okay, because that's where the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are formed. So you see what I'm saying? You know the anatomy and physiology of red blood cell, white blood cell, and platelet production. They're producing the red blood There's damage or injury. In what way? How can the red blood, red blood marrow be damaged or injured? In aplastic anemia. Is it not in the book? Is that book limited in information? Yes? Is it that the leukocytes attack the stem cells in the down The leukocyte attack the stem cells? Did you read this in the book? About a plastic anemia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is it then? I don't know. I'm asking you. <laughs> I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> Exposure to certain chemicals. When I was a young man, I went high school, and in high school we were told to plant. Uh, our school was a little bit advanced because it was an American missionary school, so. We had, we had all these gardening tools. We were, you were, we were trained to uh, plant, and my God, we, we remember those days, but at, this was in the 70s. We prepare a plot, we put all those vegetables there, we plant them, tomatoes, one straight line, big, because we're a big place. But we were using these chemicals called insecticides, pesticides, malathion, oh my God, those, I can remember, malathion. You will die if, you, okay, what will these drugs do? Destroy your what? Do you understand what I'm saying? It could destroy your what? Bone marrow. Exposure to certain chemicals during those times will kill, the, will destroy the red bone marrow. The bottom line, therefore, is be aware of these things. Nowadays, we're very, very particular because any drug or any chemical exposure, they, they put that in the what? In the, the label of the substance. This drug or this chemical is carcinogenic. This chemical can lead to a plastic, something like that, right? The idea is therefore be aware of that, right? Okay, now, in people with kidney disease, what causes the anemia in people with chronic kidney disease? Does anybody know? Erythropoietin. What about erythropoietin? What organ produces the erythropoietin? The kidney. What's your name? David. David, what organ produces the erythropoietin? The kidney. The kidney, which makes sense, right? If the kidney is destroyed or damaged in chronic kidney disease, will that be able to produce erythropoietin, David? No. And what does erythropoietin do, David? It uh, stimulates your body to create more... Which blood. part of the body is stimulated? Your bone marrow. Okay, the red bone marrow is stimulated by the erythropoietin produced by the kidney to produce more red blood cell. In other words, if the kidney is destroyed in chronic kidney disease, will you be able to produce the erythropoietin? No. Will you be able to produce red blood cells? No. You end up with what? Anemia in chronic kidney disease. Now the bottom line, what do you think Dr. Gamo will order in the chart, in the treatment? Yes, David? Um, synthetic erythropoietin. Of course! What does synthetic mean, David? Man-made. Man-made! Don't you love this? The smart people of the world use their mind. It's not even being smart, it's being common sense, right? You lack erythropoietin. What do we give you? made in the lab by the chemist. My son is a chemist major, right? So I hope he can come up with a drug that makes him become rich and he will take care of me, I hope, right? Become a multi-billionaire, you know? Go to the lab, make a product, 
take up a drug that will be needed by billions of people, you earn billions of sales, right? Now, erythropoietin, maybe not so much, only those with kidney disease, but still, it's being used in the market, right? If you go to the Vita dialysis centers, all these people are on dialysis, what are the chances of taking those synthetic erythropoietin? What is the name of this synthetic erythropoietin? Who's an LVN here? Nobody is an LVN here? You know what's an LVN, licensed educational nurse? Nobody, really? Usually unusual, it's normally usually one or two or three. What's the name of the drug called synthetic erythropoietin? Procrit? Are you an LVN? No, but I've heard of the drug. Procrit, okay, okay, anyway, it's a, it's a drug that we give now. Anyway, you like it, you give it. You know what I mean? There you go. Now, let's move on to, uh, in terms of hypersensitivity. One of the best ways, and I think I, I did this last time, I tell people to think of it in terms of uh, cupping up with a table or tabulating, right? So let's say, very briefly, you have type one, type one, two, three, and four, right? So the topic here would be what? Hyper what? Okay. So you can tabulate it like this or concept map. One, two, three, four, right? Now, which among these four will be involving the B cells? and plasma cells and antibody production. One, two, and three. So one, two, and three will be B cells, which become plasma cells, which produces what? Immunoglobulin, which are what? Anti what? Bodies. In other words, type four involves what? What cell? B cell. So you try to summarize everything, right? Okay. Type one, what is type one? What's another name for type one? Immediate hypersensitivity, which means the effect could be there within 10 or 15 minutes, okay? What is the immunoglobulin involved here? IgG. It's usually seen in allergies, allergic rhinitis, right? Atopic dermatitis, right? Does it make sense? Asthma and obvious asthmatic effects, right? So what are the other things? Like when you have allergic rhinitis, okay? You have orticaria, all these signs of symptoms of allergy. And what do you normally give you? Antihistamine. Why? Because what is involved here is what cell? Your mast cells. Mast cell. Mast cells produce what? Histamine, right? And what does histamine do? It causes vasoconstriction or vasodilation? Vasodilation. Vasodilation causing more blood that it's red, right? Dilate. Blood flow increases, right? Like, have you ever uh, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer? Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Why is there increased blood flow? It is the effect of histamine causing the blood flow to di dilate more blood flow. Will there be pruritus? What is pruritus? Redness. Huh? Redness. What is red pruritus? Itchiness. Itchiness. Okay. Now, type 2. What example? Of type 2 is what? Type 2 toxic, tissue specific, right? Type 2 lytic. What are the examples given in your? Hmm? What? Blood transfusion. Blood transfusion, BT or blood transfusion reaction. So for example, I am blood type what? Blood type B, right? Who is blood type B here? Nobody is blood type B, really? I would have given you extra points if you were B. I'm blood type. <laughs> Don't tell a lie. Okay, Dr. Gamo is blood type B. If my red blood cell has type B, what is the antigen on my red blood cell? B. It's not going to be letter B, but it has to be the antigenic surface. It just it simplifies things. So if I have B antigen on my red blood cell, what do I have found around this? Anti-A antibodies, right? Found where? In the plasma surrounding the cells that I have. My father is B, my mother is B, I am B. So what happens? Can blood type A be given to me? No. No. Why? Because... So the red blood cell there is A. If this is the blood, remember the blood is placed in a bag like this? This blood came, who is A among you? Don't ever give your blood to me, please, por favor. You kill me, okay? If this is blood type A, the red blood cell is A, and this is Dr. Gamo here, lying down here, and the blood bag is given to you, what do I have? 
I have anti-A antibody. So the moment your blood goes to my beautiful veins, this is what's going to happen. Interceptors immediate launch. Enemy approaching, enemy approaching. Here comes the red blood cell with A antigen. Attack, attack, attack. So this will attack. This is in my body. But the blood is, the, the word is the battle. The epic battle will occur where? In my body. Because the blood was given to me by the incompetent nurse and doctor. <laughs> so the blood given to me will be attacked by my antibodies and what will burst? This will burst here. Is that called hemolysis? Does that make sense? It's called the BT blood transfusion reaction. So would that kill me? Because it affects the kidneys and all the other organs, right? Is that therefore important that nurses must know the proper match? In fact, this is what we normally do in the, I don't know if it's being done here in the US, but I think it's probably done the same thing in the Philippines. If a patient needs blood transfusion, we examine the bag, the bag that contains the blood, and make sure that it is really what? What are the chances that <laughs> clerical errors, doctor, the patient died because of clerical error? The label was A, but in fact, what is uh, uh, B, but actually it was A. Can that happen? Yeah. Human error caused human death. Stupid person who placed the label here. You know what I mean? So what we normally do is that we do what we call X or cross match, which means that even though I tell you I am B, but it, pretend that you don't believe me, you get my blood specimen and examine it under the lab, and then find, he claims to be B. Is he really B? Okay. Now some go, go countries in the world, their diverse license has the blood type. Like Joel Gamo, MD, blood type B. So if I have an emergency, I am comatose, they don't know my blood type, it will be made easy because in the ambulance, they can always say, okay, we have a, a, we have a 58 year old good looking guy. Okay. That's me. Uh, he needs blood type B. So they can prepare 10 bags. He has massive bleeding, blah, blah, blah. We try to stop the bleeding, but we need blood type B prepared. You know what I mean? So the moment you give them, give me A, I will, I will die because this will react. My antibodies will attack what? The donor's red blood cell, which is A. Because why? Anti-A and the red blood cell is A. Don't ever give me. What about A, B? Same thing. The only blood that you can give me is B or what? O. Why? Because O does not have any antigen. It's a universal donor. What is a universal recipient? A, B. Because their plasma does not have any antibodies. Do you understand? Now, anyway. So th th this is what happens here in, in terms of blood transfusion reaction. Like what else? That can lead to type 2. Yes? Myasthenia gravis. Okay? And what does myo mean? Muscle. Asthenia means weakness. Again, another form of problem here is by saying, we'll talk about this later on. What else? What about Graves' disease? Yes. Effects what? On the, on the pituitary gland and the thyroid gland, right? Hyperthyroidism, right? What else? Is there anything else that you can add here? Blood transfusion reaction, Mestinia Graves, okay? Now, what about type 3? What's a common example here? Complex. Immune complex disease, right? So you form antigen, antibody complex. Antibody attacks the antigen, you form a complex, immune complex disease. The most common is S, what is SLE, right? Systemic lupus, erythematosus. My mom died at the age of 43 because of this. I was only 16, very young. My mom died at the age of 43. This is the worst, for me, this is probably the worst kind of autoimmune. Autoimmune diseases affects mostly women between the ages of 20 to 40, 20 to 50, middle-aged women. It, your own body, auto means self. Your own self body attacks your own other cells. And they say it's usually due to what? You have a, like a virus infection or bacterial infection. Your antibodies are supposed to kill the virus or bacteria, but aside from killing the virus or the foreign body, it also attacks you now. It turns against you to attack every cell or every part of the body. Here it attacks your brain. You have cerebritis. It attacks your what? The lupus. Lupus nephritis, it even attacks, I'm not kidding, you're right, anti-DNA 
antibody. Can you imagine? Attacking your own DNA here. So there's really no cure. You have no cure, you'll die, right? Attacks your kidney, you have lupus nephritis, you attacks your brain, cerebritis, pneumonitis, lupus pneumonitis, right? You understand? Now what else? What about post trap glomerulonephritis? Glomerulonephritis means the glomerulus of the kidneys are affected. Post trap means what? After a sore throat with streptococcus pneumonia or staphylococcus infection in the throat, after one week you develop what? Red urine. What is red urine? Hematuria. What is hematuria? Hema, red. Uria means the urine turns red. What's the normal color of the urine? Pale yellow, yellow to amber, right? So it turns red, that means there's bleeding. And you see that here. It started as a sore throat with strep infection, and then you develop antibodies against the strep, but unfortunately also attack your what? Kidney through the glomerulus. It's called glomerulonephritis. Does it make sense? You end up with blood in the red blood cell in the urine because of the inflammation of the glomerulus you have. Now, what about T cell? What is this? Delayed one. High par sensitivity, which is usually seen where? When you do your what? Your tuberculin test. What's the name of the test? Is it PPD or Manto? The Manto test, the name of the test is French. And what do you inject? PPD or tuberculin, right? What does PPD stand for? Purified protein derivative. Purified protein derivative, or otherwise known as tuberculin. That is what we inject, but the actual name of the test is what? In honor of his French guy, Manto. Okay? So when is the, if you inject, let's say, 6 in the morning of Monday or 7 in the morning, how many hours after to come back? 48 hours. Do not forget. It will come out in the nursing board exam. 48 hours, then you can come back and be examined for what? What are the positive signs? 10 millimeter. 10 mm what? Injurated. Injurated means heart raised, elevated bump or elevation of lesions. So when you say injurated, it has to be red. And heart 